33rd anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood. Yes, I am that old. And next month, I'll mark the 34th anniversary as a deacon. Now, all that really means is that for three decades, I have been, I know what it's like to be an outsider. I know what it's like to be an outsider and to have superpowers. Among my super special powers is the power to dampen parties with the words, Hi, I'm a priest. And even after all these years, I still have people sputter, but, but, but you're a woman. What did they think I was? A poodle? But being different didn't start with ordination. It began with those same rites of passage that most of us experience as we enter into the sixth or seventh grades, and then we discover a body-mind disconnect. Now, this may have happened to you, but perhaps you know what it's like when suddenly you become aware of yourself, you become aware of others, and in my case, you become aware of boys. And I wanted to look and act a certain way, but my arms and legs wouldn't coordinate it didn't translate well to my body. Walking down a school hallway was a little bit like being a member of Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks. I knew I wasn't like other people who could just sort of glide down the hallways and then glide onto the playing fields with ease. That was not me. Maybe you have felt different too which was only highlighted by the ability to develop a zit on the tip of your nose on the night of a big date. Or maybe it was the ability to sound like English really was your second language when you tried to talk to somebody you really, really liked. Or maybe you were the only one in the class who knew the periodic table. Would that have been you, Dave Blake? You, just, you didn't just know the periodic table, you loved the periodic table. Or maybe you thought history was fun. Or maybe you liked to read, and that made you different. And that's not even touching on the all-important area of sexuality. You're different. You're just different. But there is one difference I share with you, whether you are here or watching on Facebook, and that is our faith and fellowship with Jesus. That's been very, very different these days. Christians may look like everybody else, but we are not like everybody else. We are not supposed to be. We're different. In the South, we are still somewhat protected from the view that most of the world has about Christians that we are naive at best and hypocritical at worst for believing in Christ and for trying to be followers of the Messiah. But beloved, that's nothing new. That's nothing new. In John's gospel, which you sort of kind of just heard, we hear Jesus praying to his father about and for his disciples. We hear Jesus saying, the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. The world always hates what it does not understand, substituting fear for knowledge. And despite the great threats that Jesus foresees against Christianity, he does not ask them to be taken out of the world. He just says, protect them from the evil one that can kill the soul and not just the body. So what kind of threat do we pose to the world after 2,000 years that we are still the object of ridicule and scorn? What threat do we pose? Well, the threat we pose is the threat that, becomes, that comes from being vulnerable to the world and all its pain. The threat we pose is standing with the world in that pain and showing the love of Christ. And that's what our health care workers have been doing for the past several months, being Jesus, even if they don't profess them as Lord, 
And even if they come from different faiths, their actions have been Christ-like. And we need to be reminded that acting as Christ makes a difference. It makes a difference. It always has. So let me tell you one story of what happens when a person decides to make a difference. During the Second World War, the European nation of Bulgaria was allied with Nazi Germany, yet not a single Bulgarian Jew died in a concentration camp. How did that happen? Well, it happened because the Bulgarian Christians stood against the persecution of the Jews. And one incident in particular was a turning point. Here's the story. The Nazis rounded up hundreds of Jews and had them imprisoned behind barbed wire enclosures. And you know what would happen next. Soon a train would arrive and the Jews would be squeezed into boxcars and then shipped off to concentration camps and to almost certain death. And then a very strange image happened. It was the leader of the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria, Metropolitan Creel. And as he approached the entrance of the barbed wire enclosure, the SS guards raised up their machine guns and told him, stop, Father, you can't go in there. But instead, he just laughed. And then he went into the midst of the Jewish prisoners. And the doomed Jews gathered around him, wondering what a leader of the Christian community would have to say at such a desperate time. Well, he raised his arms and he quoted this one verse from the Hebrew Bible, from the book of Ruth. Wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And with these words, the Jews began to cheer, and the Christians outside the camp who had followed him began cheering. And then it attracted the attention of others that joined the crowd. And the SS troops, surveying the scene, decided that discretion was the better part of valor, and they left the town without any captives. That's making a difference. That's making a difference because Jesus has made us different and led us to follow a different code. Several weeks ago, you and I were horrified by the revelation of the murder of Ahmad Arbery, a young African-American man who was hunted down and killed by two white men. But here's a what if. What if, what if, there had been a follower of Jesus on the scene who stepped up and stepped in and stood beside Ahmad. Would the story have had a different ending? And there's that word again, different. How are we to make a difference? Beloved, every time we are willing to be different, to live out our faith, we are making a difference. And you can do that every day in everyday encounters. And eventually it becomes like muscle memory. And all those kinds of actions prepare you for the day when something big does finally happen and you need to make a stand. And you can do it because you have that muscle memory because you have been practicing all your life. So that leads me to one last story, and that's of Jonathan Daniels. Some of you know this story. Jonathan was a 26-year-old white man attending an Episcopal seminary in the early 1960s. And he'd gone through his own crisis of faith with the death of his father and then with an extended illness of one of his sisters. But he came out of that crisis. In fact, he was drawn out by a call of God, calling him to the priesthood. And since I know something about seminary, I can tell you that day in and day out, Jonathan was being challenged to live the life of a follower of Jesus. 
Now, for Jonathan, at that time and in that place, it meant going to Alabama and being part of the Civil Rights Movement. And on August 14th, he and a Roman Catholic priest went to grab some sodas at a local store along with two young black teens. The store was one of the few that were open to African Americans. And standing in the way was a white man, Thomas Coleman, with a shotgun. Coleman threatened the group, and then he leveled his gun at 17-year-old Ruby Sales. And Daniels pushed Sales down, and in doing so, he caught the full blast of the shotgun. He was killed instantly. Jonathan was different. Jonathan did not intend to become a martyr that day, but that's his label in the Episcopal Church. He saved Ruby because day in and day out, he knew that Jesus had saved him. Saved him not just for eternal life, but saved him to be among those who bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. But the story doesn't end there. You need to know also what happened to Ruby Sales. According to one story, Ruby was so traumatized by Daniel's murder that she nearly lost the ability to speak for almost seven months. And despite death threats made to her and to her family, Sales resolved to testify at Tom Coleman's trial. Coleman was acquitted by a jury of 12 white men, and he said in a CBS interview a year after the killings that he had no regrets, declaring, I would shoot them both tomorrow. Ruby went on to attend the same seminary as Jonathan. She's still alive, and she continues to work as a human rights advocate. Ruby is different, too and she continues to make a difference. So what about us? What about us? Well, every morning we put on Christ, and by evening's in, we probably have to acknowledge how we've put off Christ during the day and sometimes put off other people by our less than Christ-like behavior. Some of us wear visible signs that we follow the crucified one, by wearing a cross around our neck or on a lapel. And if we are honest, the sign is as much for us as it is for other people. It's a reminder of who we are and whose we are. We're Christians. We may look like everybody else, but we're different. We're supposed to be. We have the power. You'll hear that story next Sunday. We have the power, the power of Christ, which is the power of crucified love. It's a power to stand up against the great evils of this world. And it's, a power that full, it's a power that's vulnerable enough to draw alongside the kid with the zit or the awkward kid who never makes first string. It's the power to stand up to Nazis or to lay down your life for a young girl. We are the Christians, and we're here to make a difference. Thanks be to God. Amen.